Hey, Joe Hope, thank you um, for coming um, to talk to the magazine today. You know, I'm excited for you because of season two, you know, you're yeah. recurring, but I'm not going to lie. Season two, even season one, Jesse just, he he does something to me. I don't know why. I'm, I'm trying to love him. I'm trying to love him. Yeah. So you have a problem with Jesse. So explain what your experience of Jesse is. So Jesse, okay, I'm not going to lie. The reason why I have a problem with Jesse is because he reminds me of my late father because ah. we have the same type of oil, water, vinegar, however everything goes. It just because we are so much alike that we're yeah. not alike and yeah. we don't we don't even see it, but everybody else sees it. Like, so that's why I think I have a problem with Jesse because. It's the beauty of the storytelling, man. Listen, yeah. I think it's I think it's the mark of successful writing that yeah. people have a problem with Jesse. Yeah. Um, and I think, but to to your own example, I think people have a problem with Jesse because they recognize the Jesse in their lives. Yeah. And you know, so for me, it's a real challenge to give this guy some integrity, give him some uh, dignity, but have him be wonderfully flawed. Yeah, You know, he's the guy that's trying to make the most out of what he has as well. And he's a good dude who has made some mistakes in the past, who has made some decisions in the past that he probably would reverse if he could, you know, that came out of his own inability to handle his circumstances. And, you know, now he's trying to make it right. And his boys are like, I'm sorry, but where were you? Yeah. No, so, I, yeah. I want to get into your origin story, but I, I definitely love to talk about this because it's right now. I don't want really to like to make sure that people are on the forefront of making sure we um, all support All American um, Homecoming season two. Yes, please. Um, and so I think the thing is, what what about Jesse that gets me is like now I can also play devil's advocate because at the same time he was wrong. So it's just like sometimes it's easier for us to villainize him, but at the same time, we're not looking at a man who was hurt and then just, you know, so it's easy for the son to go, well, could you have thought I could have been your kid? But it's like in that mindset, when you're thinking your wife cheated on you and you now she's yeah. getting out of wedlock, we have to also give Jesse a pause. Like, yes, you're looking at this beautiful little baby, but you're also like, I, I don't know your mind. So you're actually a reminder of uh, indiscretion. Yeah, you, you have to, you know, if you go just big picture, right, you have to first of all think about what were you like at 25 years old? <laughs> you know, maybe maybe you're younger than that now, or maybe you're 20, you know, 20 in your in my 20s, man, my head had like a rotor on top. I didn't know what I was doing, why I was doing it. At the time, I thought that I was doing all things from a smart place, right? And yeah. now I'm like, man, what were you thinking? So he's a young dude. He's in a relationship. He's married. He suspects that his wife has been involved with another man, right? So he's got, he's all in his feelings. Now, every time he looks at the child, he's in his feelings and he's trying to make decisions. Like they say, don't drive angry. Yeah. Jesse was always driving angry. <laughs> <laughs> he was just, he was just trying to drive straight. So yeah. I, I, I can, I can absolutely, I mean, the character is written to create that sort of conflict, right? He, mm -hmm. he is clearly not the person in the cast. You're supposed to say, Jesse. And so I kind of embrace that because for me, the the joy of acting is to never assume, never presume and never judge your character. So they may give me scenes that to the outside eye, people are questioning my decision making. But for me, I understand why I'm doing everything I'm doing. Yeah. And in those moments, it makes sense. And and, you know, for the most part, he's he's done a pretty good job. He's raised these two boys that are both playing division one baseball. Yeah. You know, or he's the father of these two kids and he's, and he's doing his best to communicate with them. Right. So I think it's great that people have polarizing views on him. You know, somebody in that show can't be beautiful. Yeah. I, <laughs> he says this beautiful cast and everybody just being positive. But, you know, I think the thing is, okay. So when like, you know, last week's episode and the episode before that, when he brings in the, um, the other guy from the other team, right. When he does that. But also I think that's smart because he sees something in his son and he sees like, okay, you know what? I see you feel like you're, you're top notch and you are, but also it's like my dad, when I got to be in piano, I sucked at piano when I was in high school. Right. I, I only passed because of muscle memory, only because I could look, <laughs> look at my friend and do it. Couldn't read, couldn't write, no, it was like drum line all over. I just, I could just do that. I said, but I got a B. My dad said, it's not an A. But I said, I use muscle memory and I couldn't do it. He said, then why didn't you use your muscle memory to get an A? 
And, and, you know, so I see that type of similarity where it's like, I'm doing this also two things, a little bit out of spite. I see I'm, I'm also getting you back because I don't know how to express myself and I'm feeling a little, but also it's like, keep your spot, keep going, keep pushing. You know what I mean? Because it does, it is that thing where I think it's, 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 it's one of those catch 22s, you know, it's like people might not like that, but you're helping someone not become complacent as well. Cause you can't just be the best one on the team. And then where does the, where does the player go after that? Yeah. And you know, I, I honestly don't feel like Jesse operates out of spite. I think that Jesse operates out of, he has a code. And there's a way you do things, right? I mean, I had a hard ass dad. A lot of us come from hard ass dads. And the hard ass dad, like you said, you get a B. It's like, well, you could have gotten, if you can get a B, you can get an A. <laughs> and and uh, I think the way Jesse, Jesse has a job. My job is to make the best team possible. And a team has to be of one, of one mindset, of one purpose, of one unified goal. So if there's somebody here that wants to go elsewhere, then go elsewhere because I don't want that in my locker room. It's my son, so that hurts, but it's also like, here's the lesson. Your words have meaning and your actions have meaning. Yeah. And if you're going to go over there, then my job to make the team great is to find this other dude that can come in and do this job. So now you want to come back. It's like, my job isn't to take care of your feelings. Yeah. My job is to be successful as a coach. And I think I pretty much win every game I coach. So let's also look at the record of Jesse Raymond. <laughs> it's funny you said that. I love that because now I think about it. It's 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 the thing. When I look at these shows, I really like to break them down, right? I'm just that guy. Whenever I'm looking at any, I, first, I love to always support anything with a black cast, a black show, yeah. or even black leads. If you're a rising star in a black show, I'm going to watch it. Even if you don't black one there, I'm trying to be all black on every day, right? <laughs> And I think what's great is because your character with like um, Kelly's character too, where they both have to understand, I think people start looking at them differently. Like she also had to go, well, you can't be aunt's favorite auntie now, your principal, I mean, your president. So you can't right. do what auntie used to do. Right. Well, um, Jesse, it's like, no, I make this decision as head coach, but y'all yeah. see me as his dad. So you guys are actually projecting when that's not the case, because if I was anybody else, every coach that is like me would do the same exact thing, but because I'm the father, but I need you guys to also look at the roles differently and not try to put, put me in one when I'm being the coach. That's right. Because he also has to be fair. So if your father's the coach, there's already going to be more suspicion if you are given leeway. Yeah. So in a way, I, I remember once, uh, when I was around seven or eight years old, my mom, one of her many jobs, she was also a substitute teacher on occasion. And one day she came to substitute for our class and I walked to the desk and I said, Mrs. Holt. And she said, you can call me mom. <laughs> I, like, I don't want anybody in class thinking that I thought I was any different. You know, this is Mrs. Holt today. And, you know, there, so there is that potential conflict of interest that uh, to the point Kelly is also dealing with, right. With, you know, you're having the family dinners and you're close to these students, but ultimately is there a conflict of interest? So I think that, I think Jesse has, he definitely has problems communicating with his kids and he also has his guilt. He does feel bad about the things that happen. And he has to try to balance that with, I have a job to do. Mm -hmm. I have to be a leader of young men as well as a father figure, but I'm also a father, but I, it's, so, and look, I'm trying to say, hey, son, understand me. My sons are like, understand you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think, um, you know, to end the part about him, because I want to get on to also about your career and other things going on. I do love that last week's episode, really. Um, I'm going to watch this one after this week's episode, after we get off. Um, because I love how he ended with saying, tell me about my son. Tell me who he is. I think that just shows such... What, what I love about this show, especially on the CW, right? It's not a Black network and it's not right. one to be known for having like this many Black shows at one time. That right. it shows a Black father, Black man being vulnerable at the end of the day. You know, saying I'm taking all my pride aside because I don't even like the assistant coach I got on here because I know he undermines me and wants my position. But like, I don't think people understood how much you have to swallow to go, tell me about my son. Oh man, yeah, it's a it's a a real look in the mirror moment yeah. where I have to not only ask about my son, 
but I have to ask the father figure to my son, who's not the father to my son, who's looked at as a father of my son, about my son. It's a real like, you know, I think it's a great moment for Jesse because it is like you said, there's vulnerability there. And there's the acknowledgement that I can't do this all. And I did make mistakes. And now I have to ask this guy who's a longtime friend, a longtime ally, but who we're now sort of cast in this competitive role with, right? There's a whole lot of unspoken stuff going on. These two black men who are both dealing with all these young black men and young men in general, and they're trying to raise them. We have our old school stuff and our new school stuff, and it's a lot of stuff to manage. Yeah. So I loved, I, that's one of my favorite episodes. Uh, I just had so many levels to get to play with. It's always great working with these, these other actors, uh, Corey, Sylvester, Peyton, man, it, it's, it's, it's a great time on set. And these are all professional cats who know what they're doing and they're bringing it. So it, it, it really has given me some nice moments where you have to just drop your guard and see what's there, you know, as an actor, I don't know what's going to be there. You know, I just know that I can't win with bluster uh, that I have to try to deal with that, painful place inside that everybody's going to come to if they're if they look at themselves honestly yeah everyone should everyone doesn't but everyone should take a look at themselves <laughs> and at some point there's going to be a reckoning yeah. and i think that uh the i've been fortunate enough to have writers who have allowed jesse to start to grow instead of just stick him in this sort of you know i'm the coach yeah. role which they could have done so I, i'm unfortunate that they gave me some some good writing Nice. I love that. And speaking of writing, you have been in tons of things, right? And I don't like to age people, but when you go down to people's IMDb's, I always, I think it's a testament to like, you know, if I could, if I go back to the nineties for you, and it's 22, that's a good thing, right? Yep. Uh, Walking Dead, um, daytime television. How did you get to be this type of actor today, right? Like what was the love behind it? And how did you keep your career going especially as a black actor and being yeah. so versed and with so many different types of roles tv shows and networks which is sometimes hard it's a really competitive industry it's wildly unfair uh the parts you get is an african-american male certainly starting in the 90s but even today are kind of carved out they're they're uh they're almost they're kind of curated for a specific way of casting black men that uh, has never been satisfactory for me. And I think from an early standpoint, I came to New York in 1993 and I knew nothing. I, I literally knew nothing. I had done a couple of plays in college. I wasn't a, a theater major. I just knew that this is what I needed to do after college. And I moved here and I started waiting tables and bartending and just hacking it away, you know, find an acting class and, yeah. My, uh, my my mindset was always try to be great at what you do. So try to learn as much as you can. You know, if you don't know, if you don't understand Shakespeare, you have to find a Shakespeare class. If you don't understand Chekhov, you got to find a Chekhov class. If you don't understand film and television, you got to go up to Columbia University, NYU and get in student films. You got to just, you just have to hack away until you are to, with the goal of being good as, as, as many things as possible. You know, you don't have to do that. There are people that are just TV stars, the people that are just film stars. Uh, one of the lessons you learn doing this is that it's incredibly nonlinear. Uh, I've been making a living at it for over 20 years, and I can't tell you how to make a living at it. But when I talk to students of mine, I teach at NYU sometimes, and when I talk to students of mine, I just let them know you need to have a code and you need to know what you're about. Yeah. And whatever you're about is what you need to stick to, because you're going to be beset upon by all sides, by charlatans and liars and, and people, you know, who are just silver tongued devils that tell you they love you, then abandon you. And you need to have something you believe in. And I do believe in the work. And I may be sort of dogged about my commitment to the work that may interfere with me in some other ways. You know, maybe I should be promoting more or more on social media. I don't find that to be fulfilling, but for me, it's, if you commit to the work, if you commit to trying to be great at the work, maybe you will be, maybe you won't be, but that commitment to trying to be great, it always gives you something to rely on when times get lean. 
yeah. you know, because you're going to have ups and downs. I've done well as an actor and I don't feel like I'm working all the time. And I have that kind of IMDb where I've been working pretty consistently. You know, it doesn't necessarily feel that way, but that's the truth. And there's just a psychological toughness I think you have to have. Yeah. As a black male, you have to be, you have to know when to say no. You have to know when to say this is not an audition for me. And I think having been raised by parents who were very uh, intelligent, very proud, and who uh, and, and made it very clear to us that we were from something and of something, yeah. uh, I kind of refused to be taken for granted and I refused to be um, marginalized by the characters. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to let you tell me what I'm supposed to be. And, uh, and I'm not going to just take whatever you throw my way. Yeah. So you lose out on some stuff that way, you know, there, you know, maybe I would have had a larger career if I was willing to play the game in my twenties and thirties, but it's not worth it for me. Um, I didn't grow up watching a whole lot of dignified, intelligent black men on TV. And my dad was one, and my mom was a dignified, intelligent black woman. They are, are both. And I didn't want to have to sing for my supper in that way, right? Like that term cooning, uh, which is such a, a, a strong, harsh, but I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I won't do that. And some will and some do, and that's their business, man. I'm not, I'm not paying for your rent. So you go do what you want to do. Yeah. But to me, everything has a cost. And, and for me, uh, I'm going to show up on time. I'm professional. I'm going to, I'm going to show up ready to work. Uh, and I want to try to be good at everything. I want to be able to walk into a sitcom audition one day and then walk into an audition for Henry the fourth the next day and be able to do equally well. So I think that when in doubt and when I have uh, struggled, which you're going to do in this business and in this life, the work has kind of been the thing to bring me back. You know, are you feeling down? Well then call five friends and read a Shakespeare play at your house this weekend. You know, the work is always there. You may not always get paid for it, but the work is always there. Nice. No, I love that. Um, I do want to touch on when you talked about fulfillment, but when you said you graduated um, college and you knew this was some like, this was where you were going to go earlier on, did you ever feel that like this kind of acting bug or a bug for entertainment or was it something that you got exposed to in college? And you're just like, I never knew this was a, a possibility for me. So that this is kind of a two-parter. Uh, when I trace my origin uh, of of sort of being initially bitten mm -hmm. it was actually growing up watching movies like the deer hunter and the godfather you know i grew up in the 70s i grew up watching like de niro and pacino and streep and john cazale and sydney and and bill you know doing uh, uptown saturday night let's do it i grew up watching greats greats uh during a time when the film business was all about the independent film movement artists who hadn't been having a chance. It wasn't about these really square jawed guys walking into store places. Like, hey, what a swell place. Like it had, we'd started breaking it down to like, here's what America's like. There's civil rights movements. There's a Vietnam war. There's a women's rights movement. Like we're, let's get to the, to the bottom of this. Let's get to the, the nitty gritty. I grew up watching that. Now I never thought I was going to be an actor. I was always a kid that was somewhere between making straight A's and getting put in the office for cutting up in class. You know, I was just like doing voices and doing Bugs Bunny voices with my sisters. Like I was always that guy, but I had a very stern father and I was going to become a doctor or a lawyer. You know, you're a young black kid in the seventies. You're going to become a doctor or a lawyer. If you're fortunate enough to have that kind of space, to even think about that, mm -hmm. which a lot of people didn't have that kind of space to think about that. My dad was a military officer. My mom was college educated and she worked. I had older sisters, you know, so I was fortunate to have that base level of stability. And then I got to college. I was majoring in business. I was going to become a corporate lawyer or something else soulless like that. Um, and <laughs> I love that. <laughs> at the end of my sophomore year, I went and saw a play. Uh, they were doing a play version of The Nutcracker. And I remember watching this woman in it uh, named Susanna Reinhardt, she came up from underneath the stage 
And she came out as this character, Mouse Rinks, which is, you know, the leader of the fairy world or whatever. And I was captivated. And I thought, I've got to go do this. And I didn't know anything about agents or managers. I was in my sophomore year. I switched my major to literature so I could still leave in two years. Uh, I started taking drama classes. And uh, I just knew the first play that I ever did was my junior year of college. It was actually called Women of Manhattan, ironically enough, by John Patrick Shanley. And I was sitting on stage before the lights came up. And right before the lights came up on me in this, you know, sitting at this kind of a, it was in an Italian diner. So we had like the tablecloth, the, you know, the red checkered tablecloth. And right before my first scene ever on stage, I thought, I'm moving to New York. It was as clear as day. It's like, that's where De Niro was. That's where Pacino was. That's where you go to be an actor. You go to New York. And two years later, I packed up a, a U-Haul with my buddy, Robert, and we moved to New York. I found a restaurant job, and I started looking for acting classes. Wow. And the rest is history from there. The rest is history. Nice. I love that. I love when you hear people just really say, because especially in this day and age of social media, people feel like, you know, hey, it's much easier if I, if I make the right reels and spend the time. But I think also back then, it was, it, 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 let's say, um, you know, from a parallel, like a relative standpoint, Let's say we look at TikToks and Reels as getting a waiter job because it had to help like promote and pay the bills. But for you guys, it was still also going to acting classes, going that way. It was still, there was still that balance, you know? So I always love that people hear this because it's like, you still got to grind. It's, there was no instant. There was no like. Well, you, think about this. All the people that are doing Instagram, most people doing Instagram are not getting anything from it. So there's sort of the perception, which is you've got to be on, on Instagram. Well, there are a million people on Instagram that aren't monetizing it or making or getting parts. Mm -hmm. And so you hear about the ones that get the parts and that's true for everything. Most people are not making a living as actors. Yeah. It's hard to make a living solely from your acting. But I feel like this business is very largely driven by uh, scarcity the business is driven by scarcity and fear. And if you find yourself swept up in that wave, you're going to spend your whole time like trying to get people to look at you, look, you look, you look, you look at you. And I feel like you can either spend your time and energy on that or spend your time and energy learning how to do this thing, yeah. learning how to be great at this thing, because maybe you'll get discovered through TikToks, maybe, uh, maybe you'll get discovered through being an influencer. Like I'm not, again, also being 52, which I am, there's also a world of it that I, that is beyond me. Right. So I understand I'm not going to be the old guy that's like, Oh, you, you know, yeah, do your thing, man. Like social media is your thing. If you're, you know, 20 to, to 40. Mm -hmm. And, but I also think there's a false promise. And I think the false promise is that if you, if you put out all these videos, it's going to bring you what you want. Suicide rates are up. Depression is up. This thing puts forth a lot of images that aren't true, right? Like there's there's filters and there's editing and and everybody's posting their best day. Yeah. And it so I'm very I'm very wary of uh I'm wary and aware of the effect uh the usefulness of social media, but also again, there's a cost. Yeah. And um and it was simpler in a sense 25 years ago when I could carry my black and white headshot to some casting director's office where there was a little bin outside and you could put it in with a little note in your resume and say, Hey, I'd love to, to be cut to come in. That wasn't foolproof either, but it felt like I could at least be uh, have an effect. Yeah. It felt like I could at least influence somebody's looking and I mean, it's really tricky now with, with the social media. And again, I, I won't tell anybody how to manage their business. Uh, but I think there are a lot of people looking for happiness from a place that does not deliver it. No, definitely. And I think the difference is too, even you think about like that mindset where I think it's also, I always like to look at it from a more, even like just a cognitive standpoint, right? You think about you saying, I have to go get these black and white headshots, but it was a process. 
to get those black and white headshots, you have to get the waiter job. You did the waiter job yeah. so you get the That's black right. and white headshots. You took the waiter job so you can also pay for acting classes. So That's I right. think those are the steps where it made you look at it from a business standpoint, right? Where sometimes I'm always, and I'm only 34, but still when I look at it, and I'm from the age where, you know, MySpace and Facebook yeah. took off. But I also look at it where a lot of times people think like, oh, the numbers of followings, if I have enough, then somebody might want me. But the difference is, yeah, but have you are you taking the classes at the same time too? Because you're spending more time editing than learning how to make sure you know how to reenact uh, Will Smith's monologue from Six Degrees of Separation. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like yeah, yeah, so, so I yeah, definitely- and 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 again, you 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 do what brings you what you want. The the key is to check in and ask yourself what do you want, and and is your behavior giving you what you want? You know, is it working? Uh, because I, I don't know many people that feel better after scrolling on Instagram, yeah. Yeah, but I know a lot of people that are on Instagram. So, <laughs> you know, you have to, you have to make your own, your own agreement with that kind of thing. And for me, yeah, for me, the work is more important, um, because the work is also something that I can understand. The work is something that I can make strides in. I know what it is to be in a class and have a breakthrough moment in a scene where something you've been working on for months to suddenly, Oh, that. And as a teacher, that's what I love. I love watching students have a breakthrough moment with something that's real, something that now is part of their being, part of their essence is understanding that moment of vulnerability or understanding that their authenticity is actually what's more interesting than they're trying to pretend. Um, so it, it, again, it's a, it's a complicated uh, environment, social media, and I don't envy the youth having to navigate that world yeah. uh, because yeah, man, maybe you'll get your 500,000 followers and, you know, and then you can start hawking those sneakers and maybe some company wants you to sell their cosmetics. But at what point are you authoring your creative existence? And then, you know, it all, it's also fair to ask yourself whether you even need a creative existence. Maybe you just need followers and, and that's okay too, you know, but you have to be <laughs> honest with yourself about it. Yes, definitely. I want to be conscious of our time. We're a little over, but I have two more questions, if you don't mind. Um, one, yeah, I'll, answer, I'll, I'll try to answer more quickly. Yeah. No, I'm talking about time for you, not me, but I always like to be conscious time difference and everything. Um, so too, first about teaching, when did you, um, you know, knew that was going to be another part of your um, journey and passion to teach the next, um, you know, generation of actors or just even the older generation? I, uh, I coached soccer years ago in my late twenties and coaching was a bit of a bug that immediately made sense to me. I moved back to New York about six years ago and uh, I reached out to an old friend, a director, a very talented teacher and director named Ted Slaberski. I wanted him to help me with an audition and we sat down, read through the audition and he said, when are you going to come teach? asked me immediately. And I've been thinking about trying to get into teaching. So it was sort of this, you know, lovely kismet. And he brought me over to Stone Street over at NYU. And uh, he said, I'm just going to bring you into class and I'll have, I'll have you jump in at some point. And within 30 seconds, I knew exactly what I, I knew exactly where I was. It, right. It's one of those things that just makes sense to me. And, um, because I can see what the student is doing and I can see what I can see the difference between what they think they're doing and what they want to be doing. And I can also see why they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I know I've been in that, that, you know, we all feel the same things to different degrees, to in different circumstances, but they're only like a few emotions. We all share the same emotions. <laughs> so I just felt like, and who knows, maybe I'm terrible at teaching, but I felt like I could see not only what you want to be doing, but what you don't see that you have. Yeah. Nice. What Because we can't see ourselves. So I could see somebody who's trying to bring in some element that they don't need to try to bring in, that they already have. And, and, and then I could try to give them a very simple uh, suggestion that would allow them to start playing with what they have, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to imitate what somebody else has. And then I think what I have to sort of the finishing school part of it is that I've auditioned a thousand times and I've had a hundred jobs. So I have some sense from the other side also of what it needs to look like from a professional standpoint. 
I've worked with casting before. I've been on that side of the table. So I can kind of bring in the creative organic side that the actor needs to feel good about what they do. And then I can bring in the, now here's what's going to help you win for casting directors. And it all made sense for me, you know, and I loved it. And I, uh, there wasn't a day in class that I didn't love. And I hope that it still exists in my future. Something that I never want to let go of. I'm always interested in teaching. Nice. I love that. Last question. And then um, we're good. Um, you stated earlier about setting boundaries, you know, not doing things that you didn't um, want to, um, that you just didn't want to live with later on, right? Even though you could have um, moved the pendulum forward faster or been somewhere else in life with your career. For the young actor who's just excited that they got a role, but they're in this position where it's like, I don't feel like I have a voice yet. I don't feel like I can make suggestions or I don't feel like I have the luxury of not taking that role because I need the credits. I need the experience. What advice would you give to them that they're on the fence, even though they know it's not sitting well with their spirit? This is going to fall on deaf ears, but the most important thing you can do uh, as a young person is find a job. Finding the job, uh, however shitty that job is, excuse my language, but finding the job alleviates the stress of paying for your rent. When that's alleviated, everything else is a choice. You can turn down a job if you have a job. <laughs> I've bartended at times when there might have been other work available, but you always, always, if there's one thing I can tell a young actor, you always have a choice. And the key to this, I think, business and life is to not make yourself a victim to this industry. The industry does not care about you. The industry is not interested in you. So you have to be. And if you ever find yourself saying, I don't have a choice uh, and, it, and it has to do with an acting job, you do have a choice. You do have a choice. So you can either let the business impact you or you can impact the business. But one of the most powerful things you have is the ability to say no. Now, yes, you're hungry. You're starting out. I understand. I've been there. I did background work 28, 25 years ago. I get it. But there are times when I had auditions for parts on shows when I was temping and I refused that audition because it did not represent what I want to put into the world. So when I say these things, I'm not saying this from some, from some entitled kid whose parents were in the business or who had independent money. I was a guy that was bartending, waiting tables, proofreading ga graveyard shifts. And I'm telling you, your voice is the only thing you have and you should care for it it's the most important relationship in the world is you and your voice and you should care for it the way you care for anything else. Nice. Well, thank you. You took me to church with that one. <laughs> Perfect, Joe. Well, thank you so much. I've enjoyed myself. I definitely, and I hope that you enjoyed yourself as well. I did. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed the, the conversation and thanks for asking me. Thank you.